Welcome everybody to the sixth and final episode of the Glorious Years, uh, where we recount some of the most memorable days and seasons in the club's 150 year history. Uh, the final we're talking about today is the 2004 CNG Trophy Final. Um, it would cap a remarkable period from 99 to 2004 uh, with seven one day trophy victories in that period. Um, and we're very grateful to be joined by three of the performers of that day. Um, I suppose two notable uh, points on this match. This was the last domestic 50 over final that featured a red ball and cricket whites. Um, and it was the second successive final victory against Worcestershire. Um, and we will get into that a little bit with one of our guests. Um, but let me introduce our first, uh, our first guest who played in this uh, emphatic eight-wicket victory. Um, he played for the club from 2000 to 2011, um, featuring in 180 List A matches, scored 3,716 List A runs. That makes him 14th on the Gloucestershire list in our history. Uh, he was a stylish right-hand batsman, a right arm off break bowler and was noted as one of the very best fielders in the world. Since retiring, he's moved into coaching, um, most notably uh, with a stint uh, with England as fielding coach. And now he is currently Surrey's fielding coach. He's a former club captain and uh, we say a big hello to Chris Taylor. Hi, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Neil. Uh, yeah, great to be here. So looking forward to it. Yeah. How's things going then? So you're at Surrey. <laughs> You're gearing up for a obviously a very different se season to what you thought you'd be having. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we started training two weeks ago after lockdown, which um, which I imagine everyone's found quite tough. Um, the professional game is obviously slightly ahead of the amateur game. Um, so yeah, we've had two weeks of practice, albeit with very kind of weird and wonderful protocols and lots of rubber gloves and disinfecting and things like that. Um, and we found out today that we're going to be playing some Red Bull cricket as well as T20 cricket um, in August and September. So, yeah, everyone from a cricket point of view is uh, excited to be, to be back playing and training and looking forward to, well, what the season may, may hold for us all, be slightly different than, um, than normal. Well, uh, thanks, thanks for coming on, Chris. And uh, I'll introduce now our second guest, um, who had a stellar county career lasting from 1991 to 2007. He played for Gloucestershire between 2003 and 2006. And for Gloucestershire, he featured in 63 List A matches, scoring 1,959 List A runs. He's a left-handed opening batsman. Now, he scored 46 in the 2003 CNG Trophy Final, but he went better in this match um, by scoring an undefeated 110. Um, uh, both of these matches came against his former county, Worcestershire. Um, now working as a cricket agent, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Phil Weston. Thanks for joining us, Phil. How are you? Hi, Neil. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Looking forward and, to and, talking to the guys. And how has lockdown affected you and, 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 and the career? I guess it's really disrupted the season for you as well. Um, yeah, it's been very difficult, actually. Um, quite busy. Um, believe it or not, there's been a lot of um, to and froing admin wise. Um, normally this time of year, I'm, I'm traveling around the country, catching up with players, watching games. Um, I haven't done any of that, obviously, um, but I've been pretty busy. And uh, I guess you're, you're very much looking forward to, if not watching some games in person, then I guess you'll be tuning into digital coverage of uh, many, many games. Yeah, I guess so. I don't think I'll be too welcome at, at, at games and don't fancy getting through all the, uh, the COVID testing and everything. So, yeah, I think it'll be uh, from home, unfortunately. Well, thanks for, thanks for joining us uh, t today, Phil. Um, I, I'll now move on to our third and final guest. Uh, he played for Gloucestershire between 1994 and 2006, featured in 150 List A matches, taking 227 List A wickets. That puts him ninth in the all-time Gloucestershire uh, record books. He was a right-arm fast bowler um, who developed a range of variations, um, making him a, a formidable death bowler. Um, played in many of the Lord's one-day finals, and in this match, 
he achieved the impressive figures of four for 23 off his 10 overs, which included a hat-trick spread over two overs. Uh, he's now a house master and geography teacher at Clifton College. Big welcome to James Averis. Hello, James. Hi, Neil. Hi, guys. Nice to be with you. How, how are you doing, James? And, uh, uh, and how's, how's your lockdown been? Uh, busy, yeah. I mean, we've been... Um from sort of Easter holidays at school, we, were, we weren't at school, so we, but we were teaching remotely, so normal Zoom lessons, uh, which is a sort of new, I know everybody says that the new normal. Um, and then we broke up last week, so I'm looking forward to a bit of a rest away from screens after tonight. Do you, do you, ever, do you ever pick up a bat anymore? Do you, do you, do you play locally? No, I, I, I've said that if my, my son Hugo decides he wants to play a bit, he plays at Bishopston. So if he, if he plays sort of some adult stuff later. I'll probably play with him, but uh, otherwise I I think I sort of widowed my wife to cricket for long enough that I've, uh, I've stepped away from it for a bit. Well, um, well, thanks for joining us, James. And we are going to test you out with your knowledge, really, of, of, of some of these uh, matches. So I, we, we hope it stands up for the three of you. <laughs> if you've watched any of these programmes, you'll sort of remember that we go over a little bit about the run-up to the final before we talk about the specific match. And um, I think it's worth reminding us in, in this 2004 season, we had a, a round two victory um, away to the Netherlands. Uh, so it's a big victory by 72 runs, but that did feature a century by Phil. So Phil, can I ask you, what do you remember of that match? <laughs> um, actually, Neil, I've got to be honest, absolutely nothing. I can't remember it at all. But I do, I do remember a few days in, uh, in Amsterdam, um, which was quite nice in the middle of an English season. And I think the ex for some reason the stay got extended a little longer as well, which probably wasn't the best idea in those times. But uh, cricket-wise, I'm afraid I can't remember too much from the game. So, so it was an excellent training camp and obviously <laughs> set you up for the match nicely. <laughs> <laughs> round three. Okay, we go to round three. We played Hampshire, um, a low-scoring match. We chased uh, with seven wickets down, so uh, um, only just got over the line. Um, John Lewis took four for thirty-nine. I'll, I'll I'll talk about John a little bit later. But Shane Warne played in this game, took four for twenty-three, and uh, the records prove that both Phil and Chris were dismissed by him in this match. So I actually wanted to ask you. What it was like, and let's start with you, Phil, what it was like facing Shane Warne at the height of his powers, perhaps. And, um, you know, do, 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 you, do you remember that experience? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I, I played against, I was lucky enough to play against Shane Warne a few times. He, he did play a lot of cricket um, for Hampshire at that time. And he did, you know, they, those were the days coming towards the end of the time where the overseas players did play for, you know, large swathes of the season without being called away. So, um, yeah, look, Playing, playing against people like that, um, Mura Litherin, Warren, just just amazing experiences. And um, I, I don't actually remember that game. I, I, I did look at this. I have to admit, I did look back at the scores the other day and did see that he got me out. Couldn't quite remember that. But, you know, I do remember what it was like to face him. He had an amazing presence and he was a really nice guy as well. Would, would he be the best bowler you ever faced, would you think? Um, I, th I think the, definitely the best spinner I ever faced. Um, for me, my the, the best cricketer I think I ever came across was Wazim Akram in my time as a player. Okay, he could do anything, but but Shane Warne was probably the best spinner. Yeah. And Chris, do you, do you remember facing Warn in that experience? I do. Yes, um, on a, on a couple of occasions, as, as Phil suggested. Uh, the thing that stands out with players like that are the kind of their presence on the on the pitch, huge character and. You know, it was all about him and what he brought to the, to the team. I'm going to suggest I was at LBW. I don't know for sure, but yeah. at that time, I had a theory that he basically tried to sweep everything. I, yeah, so I, I was in a kind of just past the era where all the amazing overseas players, so the West Indians and things like that, so the opportunity of playing against someone like a Warren uh, when it came around was a fantastic opportunity. Um, and yeah, not notably, the, you know, his presence and... and the confidence he gave a, a Hampshire side at the time. Um, yeah, my theory was if you, if you couldn't pick it, just try to sweep. Uh, got away with it occasionally. Well, uh, uh, we then come on to a quarter final against Middlesex at home. Um, a 16-run victory and Craig Spearman 
takes the plaudits with 62. And another home match, um, Bristol was a, a fortress in this period, um, against Yorkshire in the semi-finals. So chasing down 246, uh, scoring actually 247 for five, <coughs> with Craig Spearman getting 143. And, you know, we talked about Shane Warne and, and, and his, um, you know, immense uh, career. But I, I suppose I'd, Craig hasn't featured on one of these programmes. I'd quite like to ask you a bit of a Spearman appreciation uh, round of questions. Uh, Phil, you, you opened the batting with him. And, you know, what was, what was he like to bat with? What was he like as a teammate? Yeah, he's a really, I got on with, with Craig very well. And, um, you know, we, I think we forged a reasonable opening partnership with basically he, he, he did all the uh, amazing things and I just stuck in, but um, he, he was a, he was a very, very calm individual, um, pretty quiet. And he was, he was like that in the middle. It was, it was uh, very calming to bat with him. Um, and, and he was very talented, a, a hugely talented individual. And I, I do remember that, that semi-final very well, just purely for that innings. Uh, it was one of the best one day innings I've ever seen domestically um i think darren lehman came out and said something similar um and and really you know th he, he just he was at the top of his game at that at that time and did play superbly well against a, a very good yorkshire side yeah james what was he like to bowl to in the nets i don't think he was i don't think he was ever he was one of these batsmen who um really got sort of switched on for the match. I don't think he really wasted a great deal of energy in the nets particularly. I mean, he could play some outrageous shots, obviously, but I think he, um, he was a different proposition, you know, sort of people talk about getting white line fever. I think he had it when he, when he got out onto the pitch for a com competitive match, then he was, he was a different kind of character. Um, I, I, rem I just remember, I, wa I watched that, uh, the innings where he got 140 odd and just remember thinking that he's got, He's just playing this, you know, he's moving the field where he wants them, you know, reverse sweeping, moving the man round from the 45 and then dabbing and, you know, sweeping square then. And I remember Yorkshire just really chasing him around the pitch, really, and just thinking that was craftsmanship. Yeah, Chris, do you remember sort of, you know, you must have learned from playing with, with a guy like Craig. You know, what's your, your, what's your take? Yeah, absolutely. He, he reminded me a lot of, so... The, the kind of the early years of the successes with Kim Barnett at the top of the order. Um, Craig was obviously a completely different player, but someone that um, had that ability to dominate an innings from the, from the, from the start. Um, he was probably, whereas cricket was kind of changing at the time where Craig was probably one of the earlier kind of batsmen to start dominating bowlers. So, um, you know, we played championship matches where he'd be almost a hundred before for lunch, which was unheard of. Um, he had an amazing ability to, to score runs. And as James says, he was, it was almost playful, kind of cat and mouse type stuff. Um, and I learned a huge amount from him, especially his ability to play spin. Um, so he was, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was kind of an honor to play, play with him alongside him. Well, he, he, got, he got you to the, to the final, but you know, I now want to come on to, to the final against Worcestershire. Um, a real recurring theme across all of these programmes has been how, under John Bracewell, the preparations for the very big matches did not, in fact, change from the norm. Um, we are now in a season with Mark Elaine as player coach. So, James, from the school period, you know, what was the transition from, from John to Mark? And was there any noticeable ch uh, sort of preparation I think changes? They're very different characters where I think um, John was quite abrasive and, you know, he got fired up by being quite adversarial with the opposition. I think Boo Boo was probably, you know, obviously had that inner steel, but I think he was far more relaxed and that probably uh, made me more relaxed, I think, you know, in the, in the preparation for the matches. Um, I mean, my, my memories of Lord's finals under John was, I think I must have been 2000 and uh, being really, really nervous before we went out to bat, so, uh, before we went out to field, so nervous that I had to nip off to the loo and then uh, coming back into the changing room and everybody had gone and they were all on the field and having to run downstairs and not being in the right place. So his sort of almost like a rugby mantra of getting people fired up in the changing room 
I think that changed quite a lot with with Mark. It was much calmer. It's more about process, you know, trusting in your skills. That kind of that kind of mantra. I mean, you, you were the dominant one day team of that of that period. Um, but, but Chris, in terms of pre preparing for this specific match, you know, last the, the year before you'd been a substitute uh, in the final. Do, do you remember when you found out you would be playing? Was it an early decision? Um, and, and, and how was your preparation? Yeah, so um, my kind of record, so I was very fortunate to kind of piggyback in on a very successful team. So uh, some good all-rounders in, in Harvey and, and Boo Boo, uh, the bowlers did their job and the batters scored their runs. So there was always generally a, a spot up for grabs. Uh, and out over, the, over the season, John was very big on his theories and we need to play an extra batter, an extra bowler who probably didn't face many balls or didn't bowl many overs, given the nature of the, the format. Um, so I was very fortunate at the time to, I, I enjoyed my fielding and fielding played a huge part in, in the success at that time. So I started playing a lot of fixtures, basically as a, a batter that batted seven or eight, maybe slogged a few at the end, but spent time in the field. Um, so the previous final, the tactic was Mike Smith with bowl is eight to 10 overs, pull a hammy and I would come on and field. Um, it wasn't a great year for me. You know, John T. Rhodes was at the, at the ground. So whenever, I, whenever one makes the association with Gloucester, John T. Rhodes and myself, um, it's always a, um, you know, people always assume that it was, a, it was a fantastic year, but John T. batted middle order and fielded generally where I fielded. So it was a lot of kind of drinks carrying for me uh, and a lot of kind of 12th man duties. Um, so yeah, I fielded, I was 12th man the previous year. Um, and, uh, but managed to, to, to make the starting lineup for the 2004 game. Well, um, we get to that final, and um, it was, you know, a win the toss it was a, uh, and fielded first. Now, Gloucestershire had had quite a bit of success early in this period in, in batting first and posting scores that, that, that they, could, they could defend. But um, uh, do you remember, James? You know, was that an, an obvious field first decision? Yeah, I think I think it was. Somewhere in the recesses of my brain, I think it was quite an early start, and there'd been, um, and it was sort of. I'm not sure it was a green wicket. I'm not sure it was ever particularly hugely green at Laws, but it was. It, it seemed like a no-brainer. If we won the toss, we were going to have a uh, have a bowl probably, and I think it probably suited us at that time. Things had changed. I think we'd evolved as a team. Uh, over the period, because very early in the in that sort of successful period, we batted, or particularly at Gloucestershire, you know, at home on wickets which were dying out, you know, dying as the match went on a little bit. We'd always bat first, get a, you know, get what today would be a very average score probably, but at the time was a, you know, a decent score, and then just try and strangle the opposition. I think we evolved into a slightly different team that were, um, which were able to play you know, in various different ways, you know, we were happy chasing, happy setting. Um, but I think on that day, it was quite, it was quite clear. It was a good toss to win. I remember the changing room being quite pleased that we'd, that we were going to have a, uh, we we're going to have a bowl. Well, it was, it was a sort of instant success, wasn't it? Because uh, John Lewis claimed three yeah. early wickets and, and Worcestershire were reduced at eight for three. Um, Graham Hick got a, scored a duck. Uh, for the second successive uh, final, um, what was what was it like opening the bowling with with John? Because he he was at this point putting himself in the in the England selectors' minds. But what you know what was that like for you, James, at the other end? Well, it might it might be similar to Wezo and opening with someone like Spears. That you you know I had no doubt that Louis would do what he did every time which was put the ball in good areas move it around a bit and you know nip a couple out so I just felt really that you know I was so certain he was going to be doing that kind of thing and I think at the time he was there was talk of him you know obviously stepping up and playing for England if he hadn't already done so but there was also a bit of a murmur in the press about him potentially leaving Gloucestershire um, perhaps if he did, wasn't going to get the recognition then he might have thought about leaving so I think for him personally he was he was definitely very up for it, um, and he, he you know historically done very well against Worcestershire, and I think Lord suited him bowling from the nursery end, taking the ball away. I, did, I remember it being a really short boundary offside bowling from that end, and thinking, 
Well, if I'm bowling the other end, I've got quite a lot to play with boundary-wise on that side. So I just keep it outside off stump, do my bit and let Louis do what he does so well. So yeah, it was a pressure off situation, I think, probably. Well, the innings is, is really in three parts. So from eight for three, yeah. they put on 194 for the fourth wicket with Vikram Solanke, who would actually win player of the match for, for his 115 and David Leverdell with 66. I, I think I'd like to ask Phil, you know, these were former teammates of yours. So, you know, Vikram would, would play for England. Um, you know, you presumably know these guys very well and, and did then. And, you know, were you worried in the field at that point? That were, they, were they looking dominant? Um, not really, no, I wasn't. I mean, it, we, we were, it, it, in terms of just the general attitude, just, you know, picking up what the, the other two guys said, um, you know, we felt we could win pretty much every game we played at, at that stage in terms of, it wasn't arrogance, it was just, we were very confident. We were very relaxed side, very confident. And, you know, we had such a great start that whilst they put, I, I, you know, they batted very well and Vikram it was a fantastic knock and he's, a, you know, he's a very talented player. Um, but they never really got, got ahead of the game. And we always, you know, I, I always felt certainly from my vantage point in the outfield that um, we had, you know, we, we were in the pole position the whole way. And I, I, I felt, you know, even if they'd made another 50 more runs, that they were probably only about par. The, 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 the sun came out, the wicket was flat. And, you know, we, we were a pretty decent team at that stage, particularly with the bat. Well, not particularly with that. We, were, we, we had pretty much all bases covered. But I think one thing from that day, we did have um, a relatively, and, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, we had Avo and, and Louis at the top, um, recognised seamers. And then, you, you know, I do remember we did get by with a couple of um, guys that maybe wouldn't normally have bowled as many overs as they did. I think Mike Hussey might have bowled six or seven overs of seam. So there was, there was bound to be a little bit of period of... Um, a consolidation, I guess, from the batters there. Well, and the third part of the innings was um, James Avery's show, really. Um, and uh, look, if you if you <clears throat> watch episode two, Mike Mike Smith, James called you the second best death bowler in world cricket at that time, um, and you also at that time had the had the best, according to him, with Ian Hart. <laughs> You, you did clean up the, their tail. They, were, they, they, they collapsed 236 for nine off their 50 overs. Um, do you remember those wickets? But also, you know, I'd like to ask you about bowling at the death and the, and, and the variations, which are now commonplace, but perhaps then were, were less so. Yeah. Uh, how much do I remember about the game? Bits and bobs. I mean, you've got to remember this. Is, you're talking to someone who hadn't even recognised they got a hat-trick in the moment. So beware. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, they were classic wickets, weren't they? I think one was caught on the boundary somewhere. One was caught mid on point, deep point or something. I can't remember. They weren't, I'm not convinced they were, you know, knocking middle stump out of the ground every time, but <clears throat> regardless. Um, yeah, I just, I think probably at that time, about, you know, 99, probably that time um, and half coming in, it was quite clear, you know, that, um, Gloucester were gearing themselves up to be a one-day force. You know, that's how it seemed to me. And uh, having watched the boys in 99 and thinking, you know, being in the crowd when people were singing, stand up if you're West Country. And I've stood in the crowd with Ben Gannon at the time thinking, I wouldn't mind a piece of this. You know, this is great. And I hope I haven't missed the boat. Um, so I went away that winter and just thought, well, I've got to go. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the quickest. I'm not, I haven't got, you know, I'm not hugely tall or any of those things. I've got to have different strings to my bow. Um, so just went away and, and copied Harv, really. I mean, that was the basis of it. Just work on doing what he did in a kind of B format. Um, and yeah, and then it, it was, you know, it was all, it worked out pretty well. And I think Chris said earlier that, you know, at the time, I think a lot of batsmen let you bowl at them, you know, at, at the top of the order. They didn't come out and chase, chase after you. People like Spears did a bit. And, you know, Wezzo and Chris would have done that on their day and, and you know, when the, when the mood took them. But usually people let you bowl at them, up, you know, at the top. Um, and so it really just went pongo at the end. Um, so if you just had a bit of a change of pace and to bowl a Yorker, I think at the time, nobody was reverse ramping you, you know, off the wrong leg or anything. It was, it's a different game now, for sure. I'm glad I'm not playing it. But uh, yeah, that, it's very simple. Yorkers, snowballs, that was about all I had in my bag. James, if you were playing it now, maybe, maybe you'd be in the IPL, you know. 
Yeah, Tim said that to me a couple of times. He said, if you'd played a couple of years later, you might have been, uh, you might not need to be a teacher. I said, yeah, <laughs> po po yeah possibly, possibly. Yeah, different era. I, yeah, I'd like to then sort of get into the mindset of, a, of an opening batsman when, when you, you come into the dressing room, you're, you're chasing two, three, seven. I mean, Phil, first question is, was the feeling that that was under par and chaseable or... or or a good score. What, what was what was the feeling? Yeah, as I said before, I think it was very much um, under par. I think conditions did ease. It was a good toss to win, um, and and we felt you know very relaxed, very comfortable. Um, you know, we we did, and I, I've listened to a couple of the earlier podcasts about these years, and you know, we we, we did enjoy the, the the games I played for Gloucester at, um, when I joined the club. You know, I, a bit like Ava said, kind of piggybacked on the back of a culture that was. Um, a winning culture in one day cricket but it, but it was built on preparing properly and then just just trusting all the work you've done so yeah they, they were they were under par and we felt we were going to go out there and win and, and you sort of individually Phil you, you you'd perform well in the previous year's final this was against your former team you know was that um, double motivation for you um, you know how how was it in terms of preparing for your innings in that way? Um, the year before actually was probably um, the, the the final that I remember more in that it was there was a little bit of personal pride involved the year before. Um, it was the first year I'd come to Gloucester. Um, it was a bit of a fairy tale final to to play Worcester, and you know I did I did leave Worcester. I'd done fourteen years at Worcester. Um, I didn't leave Worcester on the best of terms um, with a couple of people. Um, and there was a little bit of a, a, a fire in my belly that year, to be honest. Um, the, the following year, 2004, um, I, I, you know, yeah, everything, all of that sort of wasn't really to the forefront of my mind. It, it was just a, a, a job of work to do, and we were very relaxed about going out there and, and doing it. Well, when, when you, you did go out, I mean, you clearly did uh, put, put on a show, because with... Craig Spearman, you put on 141 for the first wicket, but you know your specific innings, Phil. Do you, do you remember? Do you feeling in the groove? Was it was it just a good a good batting day? Um, yeah, look, I do, I do remember it, and it, you know the, those type of innings don't come along very often for a guy who uh, never had the, the you know the the, the, the honour of playing international cricket. So it was a big, you know, the, these were a couple of big innings for me. So there's no point hiding behind that. And, and I do remember a fair bit of that innings, yeah. Um, I, I think the year before, we were chasing a very low target and we came out there very much with the idea of rubbing their nose in it. And, and, we, and we certainly, you know, just, just really looked to finish the game as quickly as possible. This was a, a more, uh, it wasn't a challenging target, but it was, it was a little closer to par. So um, we just went out there and played. And I, I just remember we, we got ahead of the rate. Craig played as, as it usually does um got us ahead of the rate I sort of hung in there and, and managed to get a few a few boundaries away early which sort of calms the nerves a little bit and um once we once we've done that it was just a case of, of just playing our normal game I, um, Mike Hussey would, would come in for a, a, a 20 but Chris you uh you saw things home with Phil uh, with 22 not out um when you come in to bat in a Lord's final in those circumstances, so, so can you enjoy that more? Or is it the bit of the stress of knowing you're going to get over the line, but just wanting to be there when you do get over the line? So like the others, I don't remember a huge amount, but I do remember walking out with a very relaxed sense of, I'm going to enjoy this moment. Um, the game was kind of dead and buried, albeit just just going through the motions to, to see off the runs. So I was very aware of the crowd, the situation, the, the chicken men singing, um, you know, all those things going on. Um, Wesley's played it down slightly. I, there was a, I think when he got his hundred, we almost had a, a bit of an embrace in the middle of the, you know, he squeezed me quite hard and for a six foot, whatever Wesley is, I've been a five foot six bloke, it looked a bit awkward. Um, I think Wesley was particularly pleased to get that hundred against his former club. Um, but yeah, my memory was, was, was very much a case of the game is done and dusted, enjoy the moment, um, 
because those kind of things don't come around too often. Um, I think Ava, Ava picked up on a point that, you know, the, the team had changed a lot. You know, there wasn't the reliance on some of the other players in the past. So Harv wasn't there anymore. Snape, Barnett, uh, Jack. Um, I think we, we, we still uh, had the reputation, uh, reputation that kind of preceded us. Um, but it was very much a different, different team uh, under different leadership, uh, a different way of playing. Um, so it was very kind of special to be a part of, of something like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, Wezo was, uh, I was chuffed for him. Because I, I, I take a lot of credit, credit for Wezo coming to the club. So I think before he signed for us, um, you had myself, Matt Windows and Snape in the kind of middle, middle order. And we'd gone, I don't know, maybe four or five weeks of being out LBW, caught on the crease. And classic John Bracewell, you know, go around the change room. And we got lambasted for being, well, for being short, basically. Um, and at the end of the year, you heard whispers that, you know, the club were trying to sign someone. Are they going to sign a batter? So you start to feel a bit self-conscious. And then in walks Phil Weston the following year, who was the polar opposite of all of the middle order, who's just got a big stride down the wicket. So... Yeah, I take a lot of credit for, for Wezo joining and i um, very pleased to, to share that, uh, that kind of 100 moment with him. Um, in the Do you remember the winning moment and, and the celebrations after? Is, or or does, does one final... Yeah, yeah that's, that's a bit embarrassing. I, there is a bit of a story to that in that I... Um, you know, you kind of you visualise, don't you? You visualise the moment of taking the, the last wicket, um, scoring the winning run. And I think I saw someone do this big jump in the air and a punch. So I thought, if I'm ever in that op if I'm ever in that situation, that's what I'm going to do. So I actually watched the watched the video through um, a couple of years ago, and I kind of did this half embarrassed jump, and then quickly got down and just ran off. Um, but yes, uh, kind of back garden stuff. You visualise, you know, you want to take that catch, take the wicket, score the winning run. Phil, do you remember? Do you remember that? You know that the embrace that Chris is talking about and and, and the winning moment. Uh, yes, I do. I, I remember both. Yeah. Um, I think the big thing for me was at the end was soaking it up. I, you know, it was, we, we had won the game fairly easy, t t probably 15 overs to go. We, we knew we were going to win. And, and like the year before I probably got a bit carried away and I, I, on a personal level, I probably should have just uh, seen the game out with a nice little 60 not out or something. And I think I was pretty determined once, once we got the game one, not to get out. And just enjoy them, enjoy the time out there. James, when when you're um, in the dressing room watching a, a chase like this, are you um, you just is it is it are you able to relax completely and just enjoy what you're seeing, or you're always a little bit on edge? Um, I think as long as I'm not anywhere near putting pads on, I, you can stay pretty relaxed. I mean, I, I think the guys are right that we were. It seemed. This is going to sound cocky. It's not meant to. It, it seemed inevitable, I think, once we got off to a, the start we got off to. It, it just felt like it was kind of, we were, we were just going to inevitably win the game and win it reasonably comfortably. I think I, I, was, I was pretty relaxed because I was nowhere near getting my pads on. I remember um, Chris, and, Chris and Mike Hussey sat on, the, uh, sat on the balcony watching and a couple of wickets fell. I, I, the one thing I do remember really starkly is... Chris being pretty relaxed about the whole, the whole situation. And Mike Hussey, who was obviously, you know, had played a lot of cricket internationally and everything else, being as nervous as a kitten and just, you know, constantly tapping and checking his bat was right and, and all these sort of things. And I, it just made me think, actually, you know, this is quite a big day. It is, you know, it's, okay, it's a domestic final. It's not international cricket. But even for somebody like that who played so much, it's quite a big day. It's, and I think probably having seen that, and then 10, 10 overs later, whatever, 20 overs later, we wrapped it up. I remember thinking, you know, you've got to just take this in and really enjoy it because, you know, they don't, they come quite thick and fast in that period, but they, they you know, they don't come every year. So uh, just try and remember what, what had happened and then, uh, well, the, and then celebrate uh, properly. Yeah, I, I did want to ask you um, all, actually, um, you know, this would be the last trophy in this sort of golden period, but you wouldn't know that at the time. James, you, you played in a number of these. So, you know, can you rank them? Is there a, a favourite Lord's final for you? 
um, you know, what's what's uh, what's the top of the tree? Um, well, it, I mean, it would be difficult not to say this one because I actually, you know, I've done reasonably well in it. Um, and actually, <laughs> I've got the scorecard in my downstairs loo. So whenever I go in there, I notice whether... <laughs> That sounds very odd. I'd see whether <laughs> Chris. Well, I'm in there. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, this was great and it was brilliant. And, you know, we weren't to know it was the end of an era. For me, I thought the first two, um, I think probably the Glamorgan one for me was, was amazing because, as I said before, we had that year previously where, you know, Gloucester hadn't won anything for a little while. And then having this season where we won two trophies, it was suddenly, I think a lot of people who didn't play fringe players at the time, younger players, were thinking, like I said earlier, you know, have I missed have I missed out on this, you know, this peak? Have I missed the, you know, that day in the sun sort of thing? So to go back the next year and win two and the National League, I think that was for me, my memories are blurred about a lot of these things. And um but I remember that season being a just a a sort of road trip really of going places, nearly losing, dragging it out of the fire, winning stuff. Um, but that, that Glamorgan final, I think, stands out quite a lot. It was my first first final, so perhaps that's why. Joe, I also just want to ask you about, you know, what you felt were the overarching sort of key ingredients to this period of success, because you, you, you'd seen it all. Um, you know, you've alluded to, to a lot of it, but how would you sum it up? Yeah, I mean, I watched, I watched um, <laughs> Tim Hancock made me watch a couple of the podcasts before. Uh, so, I, you know, and it does make you reflect. And I think when I joined up as a schoolboy, um, you know, there was Courtney Walsh there, this pillar, and, you know, everybody just clung to his performances, you know, and he was obviously absolute legend. And then we went through this transitional period and nobody really knew how that was, was going to work. And I think, you know, uh, obviously Ian Harvey coming in, for me personally, was, was unbelievably, you know, transformatory. Um, but I think, you know, evolving with uh, Jack Russell standing up to the wicket and Kim and Jeremy Snape coming in. Um, and, and I think we'd gone from a team previously. We, well, I think we were good athletes who were unfit and not reaching their potential. I think John Brace would change the mentality and made it quite regimented and made everybody know exactly what they had to do. And we, we definitely went through different periods. And I think this, the, the match we're talking about today I think Wezo is right. We were more of a batting team, I think, particularly on this day. But I think going through that period, we changed the emphasis into more of a, you know, a better batting team, perhaps, than bowling team. Um, but earlier on, it had definitely been a bit of strangulation kind of a team, get a score and strangle them out of the game. Um, but yeah, I think those, those big characters I mentioned before were, were the people who transformed it. Just knowing that you're capable of winning, not looking at Surrey and thinking, well, they're always going to beat us. Yorkshire, they're always going to beat us. Uh, that was yeah. the difference. Phil, you know, you had an absolute stellar career. So I, I, I don't ask, it's a leading question to ask where this match ranks for you because, you know, you, you achieved a, a lot. But what, what, would, what would be your, you know, the pick of your, of your career? Uh, it's, I don't often get called a st stellar career, I have to say, but uh, I had a long career. Um, and, you know, this would be, there's no doubt this would be at the top. Um, I... I was involved in four Lords finals, um, two, two at Gloucester and, um, you know, the two, the two finals at Gloucester were fantastic because we won and, and, you know, I played a part and this one, you know, to get a, to get a century in the Lords final is, it, it's got to be pretty high up for someone who didn't play international cricket. But, um, you know, I, I, I probably could, could make a couple of observations just coming into Gloucester on, it, you know, I came in the middle of this golden period of, of one day cricket. And one of the reasons I wanted to come was, was to, to join such a, such a good one day unit, but to improve my own one day cricket, to, to, to prove a point that I could play one day cricket, maybe better than um, I had done in the past. And I, I knew from playing against Gloucester a lot that John Bracewell, I think deserves a huge amount of credit as, to, as does Mark Elaine for creating, I think above all a culture where we perhaps didn't have it in, in Red Bull cricket. And, and I know that was a source of frustration probably for John, but um, it was just a culture of, of, of excellence. And it was doing, it was working really hard, preparing, everyone knew their roles. As Avo said, you know, there were, there, it, it, there were some, in the early era of the, uh, of the glory years, there were three or four standout pillars like, like Harve. 
Um, but in the end, there, there were there were people that came in and learned from from the culture that had been created, and ju and just came in in a, in a in a relaxed but professional environment and did well. And um, you know, they were they were they the times my time at Gloucester were definitely the happiest of my career. And, and Chris, uh, you know, same question to you. Where, where, where would this final rank in your career? Obviously, you go on to captain the club, but you know, where, where do you place it? Yeah, um, extremely proud to, to be a part of it. Um, I kind of look back on, on my career, just like Wesley said there, you know, a, a county cricketer who enjoyed playing the game and was, was very fortunate to be a part of a successful side. Um, I kind of, the memories that stick out for me are times when, when I kind of contributed to, to wins, when, when you're playing with people like Mark Lane, Ian Harvey, Jack Russell, all these kind of legends of the game. And when you start to make performances which have contributed to wins, you feel, well, you feel personally proud, but you also feel, you start to feel a part of, of the team. Um, so as my career kind of progressed um, and making those contributions or bit small ones at times some 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 big ones at other times um so that was that was a huge huge part and this whole period of my life has been extremely influential in well my kind of career after cricket um obviously the fielding side was was a big part of the game back then um it was something i was very passionate about um and i've, I've kind of made it a, a career moving forward so um you know Fond, fond memories, and and look back with great, um, great memories, and and I suppose the discipline that was installed at me at such a young age. Um, not that I was ever going to challenge it, because you know at that time you just kind of sit there and, and listened. Um, but I was I was made very aware of the standards that were expected and what was what was expected of me um, when I kind of turned up to, to, to play. So um, yeah, it was a huge, huge part of my life. Chris, I did want to ask you about you know moving into coaching. And, um, you know, we've heard on this series how John Bracewell you know, had such a, an emphasis right from the get-go on, on fielding. But, you know, you know game-wide, do you think John Bracewell's approach and then Mark you know, rubbed off on you and, and, and has, it, has it helped you as a coach? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, you know, the, the importance they placed on fielding, well, that, you know, that was the reason I was in the side in the first place, was, was basically... a. A batter that, or sorry, a fielder that battered a bit, because um, there was far senior players on on the squad at the time. Dominic Hewson um, was one, um, and so I, I immediately saw the value in my fielding. And it wasn't difficult for me in the fact that um, you know I enjoyed fielding. So when we did fielding practice, it was just another time to to enjoy myself. And John was the type of coach that you know we're going to. We're going to catch 20 catches in a row before we go in. And, you know, and if you've ever been with your kids or at a club and you've said, oh, we're going to catch 10 before we go in and you catch, you drop the ninth one and you have to start again. It takes a bit of discipline as a coach to keep going. And John was the type of coach that, you know, his arm would be falling off and he'd still be hitting towering catches because he was true to his word. You know, you will catch 20 before you go in. So very quickly, as a, as a I remember distinctly knowing that, Everyone was like, switch on, let's get our 20 catches done, otherwise we're going to be out here for a long time. Um, and that kind of discipline led by, by Jack behind the stumps. Um, Mike Smith as a bowler, letting you knew, you know, if you were fielding too, too, too far back or not saving enough runs, you know, you were told quite bluntly, you know, you know what the standards were expected. Um, and so it's a thoroughly enjoyable time for me, thoroughly enjoyable as, um, as a young cricketer kind of coming into that environment. Well, I'd, I'd like to leave it at that point, but, you know, I want to say a, a big thank you, Chris, uh, James and Phil for joining us. Um, I mean, this is the last uh, episode of the glorious years. And, um, you know, in some ways I'm delighted because actually that means we now get some cricket in the 2020 season, um, which we're all looking forward to. Um, you know, if it's not in person, then certainly via Gloucestershire uh, digital channels. Uh, I suppose just a final word from you all. Phil, we, we, we hope to see you in 2021 when the club will celebrate its 150th anniversary properly, shall we say. Um, but can we get you down from Yorkshire for, uh, for a celebration? 
Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely, love, love, love going to Bristol and and spending time there and catching up with everyone would be great. Well, we we, we look forward to seeing you then. And James, you're you're local, but um, maybe we'll see you with with your son in tow, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Actually, my daughter likes watching cricket more than my son, so might might be with her. Great stuff. And Chris, obviously, we may we may cross paths with Surrey this season. Yeah. Uh, we wish you a certain amount of luck. As, as you go about your things, but, um, but uh, you know, certainly in your role, Chris, I, I hope you have a, a great season. We, we hope to get you back for some cent- uh, anniversary celebrations next year. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably first come back with my Surrey egg and, uh, eggshell blue, I think uh, we've called the stripes at the moment. Um, but yeah, so it's always, a, it's always a strange feeling when you walk, walk back through the, uh, through the gates, but with a different tracksuit on. Um, and it's always yes, it's a it's an interesting time, but um, we look forward to look, look forward to coming back. Well, th- thanks all for joining us, and thanks everyone for for tuning in. And uh, we'll s- hope you enjoy some cricket in the twenty twenty season. Goodbye.